Welcome, fellow Lushes. Come on in, pull up a bar stool, and enjoy some cocktails with Dimples and the Beard. So you're playing through pain. You gonna do this? No. No. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) No. I didn't. I didn't. Okay, go. (laughs) Fuck. If I'm in pain, you're in pain. It's okay now. Right now, it's okay. But it was. I don't know what it is. All right. Let's gonna open the tabby, and it's gonna be a long. She'll be early. She'll be plenty on time. So welcome back. To another episode of Cocktails with Dimples in the Beard, Annie Temple has returned. The double D. The double D. Delight for coming back a second time. What does D's have to do with it? No, I said double delight. You s- clearly said double D's. Delight. <laughs> I stuttered. I had something in my throat. I'm better than saying at the start of all of my game, I guess. So, there you go. At least we didn't call anybody. So I heard a story today. Oh, Christ. And I got to ask you a question. Uh Uh-oh. Have you ever had the urge to whack one off that you just could not wait? Number one. Like, didn't matter where you were. No. Have you ever been turned on so much from a smell that you had to whack one off? No. (laughs) I mean, kind of. Kind of. I, I am a I am a f- fan of smell. Absolutely. Yes. Good smell. But okay. Anyway, a- arousal. So the story goes. No, I've never been. I've never smelled something and went. <laughs> I, I need to touch myself. No, never. Okay. Um, and this guy is he a creep or is he a baller? So here's this thing. So two guys work together. Probably both. They work together. They carpool together. They get done with their shift. They go to the car. Oh, car's dead. Damn it. Well, we got to get home. Hey, wife, will you come get me? C- come get us, and we'll worry about the car tomorrow. So the wife comes and picks the two up. The husband gets in the car, passenger seat with the wife. Wife had just showered before bed. Smells good. The co-worker in the back seat starts jacking off. And they didn't catch him. <laughs> Dilly tried to drop him off. He was kind of cleaning up. So, anyways, the story is which coworker? <laughs> it wasn't at my work. It wasn't out of my work. Uh-huh. But it brought a lot of questions in my mind. Like, and he and so they brought it to work the next day, and the HR said, "That's it's not a work thing. That's it happened off. It happened off work property. Okay, you guys got to figure it out. That's that's, that's more." Than the jerking off in the back seat. Don't care. Who brings it to fucking HR? The the one guy did. Because are you a man? Well, there you go. So <laughs> how do you feel? Um, you ever? Here's why I'm calling Izzy a baller. Spit it out. He's in the back seat. My ass itches. Smelling the wife's hair, which got him really turned on, is apparently why he couldn't control himself because it smelled really good. Okay. But he had to have been talking to the husband while they were driving home. So it's like a 20-minute drive. You, you know a lot about this story. Oh, we talked about it. I kept asking questions, and they're like, I don't know. I didn't ask that. <laughs> I kept asking questions. Where did he sit? Sat behind the wife? Sat in the middle. So I'm like, so after work, if you're going home with your buddy. Is he a child? <laughs> if, you're, if you're going home with your buddy, uh, you're going to talk. You're not going to str- – you usually don't drive home in silence. I do. Perfect car ride home is in silence. Okay, well, I'm going to assume that they wasn't in silence. Because if it was silent, you would have heard something. So he's talking to the husband while he's smelling the wife Mm -hmm. and playing with himself. What is your question? Could you do that? Could I do it? No. (laughs) How many times have you done it? No, I couldn't do that. Now, my question is, how creepy was he? Is he he in the backseat, leaned back, and he can smell? Or is he moving? Because there's levels of creepiness that, like... If it's me in the front seat, my wife sitting next to me, and my coworker jerks off to her, but he's not all creepy about it. He's just so. I'm kind of. I mean, that's kind of a compliment. It is a compliment. It's kind of like, all right. But if he's up in her shit, like, that's a little. Then I might get a little, you know. So. So if he leans back and smells her, it's okay. 
Mm-hmm. And I get the point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's a compliment. But wait till you get home. Now, well, there's no um, fear of getting caught if you wait till you get home. Right. So, oh, so that was part of the thing. Right. Exactly. Well, I, I did ask, and we could we talk to this guy. So, <laughs> which guy? <laughs> the jerker offer. Oh, we we know who he is. I know someone that knows who both of them are. Huh? Worked okay. with them. Wow. She here? Yeah. See oh. the waiting room down there. Oh, now I see it. Um, Brand new software. We're still getting used to. Oh, she left. She left. <laughs> Fuck. Come back, Annie. Annie, come back. Let's, come. let's say you could. Come back, Annie. Do it. Let's say I could. You're in the back seat. Without you're, okay. You're smelling. It's 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 the most erotic smell you've ever heard. Huh? Smell smell. When beer hair, I was trying to smell. So you're smelling her and you're touching yourself a little bit. Could you do that while you're talking to him? No. <laughs> Having a conversation with. Uh, no. Well. As much as I want to dig more into this and your philosophies on this, we better not keep a pretty lady waiting. I know it was you. <laughs> All right. I, I don't think I could do that. Without further ado, the return of Annie Temple. Annie, my dear, how are you? Good. Do you want me to put headphones on? I don't know. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, if you can hear us, no, you're good. Yeah, I just, I know sometimes yeah. people really are picky because they worry that there's going to be an echo, I think, or something. But... Oh, no, I don't hear one. I think we're good. We don't want to, we don't want to mussy up that pretty hair. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I didn't put <laughs> yeah. them on yet. <laughs> hell no, no, hell no. <laughs> See me before I mess it up. I get it. Exactly. Makes sense. <laughs> no, I, I love that. I love that hair. I don't want to see headphones in it. <laughs> Thank you. So I wore it down just you? for you because I remember you guys were like, we were wondering if we were going to get curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. You hair. do remember. <laughs> Good memory. And we appreciate you wearing it down. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she is a people pleaser. So how hey. are you? How, how, how excited are we? Uh, you got, what, oh. six more days? Yeah. Is it six more days? Uh, eight, it's coming up. Eight. Well, one week, a week eight. from today. Okay, the book comes out. Mm-hmm. Your your memoirs are going to hit the streets. Your tell all. Your there's. I I, I got to start by just saying, Annie, you have lived a lot of life, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of life. <laughs> as I mean, we've had you on once, and I thought we kind of knew the story, but as I was reading, I was like, we only scratched the surface. <laughs> yes, and that's the funny thing, right? Because we all know so very little about each other. Right. Even when we feel like we know a lot, usually we don't really know that much. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. So is that what prompts you to write the book and get de- as detailed as you did? I think what really prompt, like there was a few different things. I'd been really encouraged for a long time to do it. Uh, that was part of it. But I just never, I never thought like, well, who wants to read my life story or what, what makes my life story any different from anyone else's really? Uh, but It's different than... It's different than, definitely different than mine. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm yet to have a gun pointed at me. I can tell you that. I, I'm waiting on that one. <laughs> no doubt. Hey, yeah, that was an interesting uh, experience. <laughs> well, oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. But yeah, I think it part of, part of it was wanting to challenge stereotypes and give people like a, an inside look at what led to the decisions that I made. Because yeah. a lot of people just can't understand, can't relate, and they just think it's like a, a defect in a person's personality to work in the adult entertainment industry. So I, I kind of wanted to challenge that. But I also, even more beyond that, wanted people, hopefully people who read the book will will want to challenge their beliefs, not just about sex industry workers, but just in general, in general, in general about people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Wait, how many interviews have you been doing? <laughs> how many drinks have you had? Oh yeah, that's oh, no, it. I should be drinking. I'd probably be doing more smoothly. I'm I'm taking a break <laughs> from drinking right now, so I've got my tea. Okay. Well, I got I got to tell you, your uh, one of my favorite chapters was was the unpopular opinion chapter because the first paragraph I was like, I agree with all of those, so Ooh. it's not that unpopular here. <laughs> we have a lot more in common than I realized. <laughs> well, 
Well, and and like most people, like we talk about, most people do have more in common than they think. Mm -hmm. They, you know, it's 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 not. If we actually sit down and talk to each other, we have a lot more in common, or we're or we're close to the middle yeah. anyway. Yeah, so. and like like the whole that whole chapter, of course, was uh, very COVID specific. And at that time, I was one of the the um, you know the bad people that people were saying need to be sent to an island and <laughs> yeah <laughs> didn't be allowed medical care and all of this stuff. And it was a it was a very I would have been, been with you. <laughs> We would have been on the same island. Woo! All the all the bad people were going to an island. It was Epstein's island. Oh yeah, yeah. those are the real bad people. Exactly. Right. We'll find our own island. Yeah. I honestly, I remember when we when they were talking about that whole when a lot of people were saying that. I at the time I was so honestly scared of my my neighbors and my government that I thought that would be amazing if all the cool people were on one island. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) You're like, doesn't sound so bad. I know. <laughs> we'd have a lot more fun, that's for sure. Well, we'd a lot have a lot more yeah. choice. And choice. Yeah, well, that's why most of most of the United States is moving to Texas. So Yes, I know. Everybody, everybody's that- leaving home yeah. and, and moving down south. So and whereabouts are you guys again? I forgot. We're in Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. So we're not far from you. Oh yeah. So do yeah. you have more of like do, is your state more blue or red? It's purple. We we will we will end up being one of the deciding factors in the election. Really, that's so it's, yeah. Cool. We're a very contested yeah. state. Yeah, so it's, your well, state it's... might have voted in my idol, the Matt, the love of my life, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Yeah, I, I was believe me. I got I. You know what? That's funny. That's funny. I forgot how I got on that train, and you were you were. She I, was in love. She went and saw him. I should have wore. I have an RFK shirt. I I I, I went out and yeah. After we had that interview, I started paying more attention to him and really, really started to fall in love with him. And I was uh, I was reminded again of how fickle politics are when he dropped out and and decided to endorse somebody who I anyway. I know, I know. <laughs> but it but is what it is. He broke it my is. heart. I, I still, he still, I still love him, but I still can, I still hang on to every word he says. But yeah, I I'm just glad yeah. I don't have to vote in the U- United States election. <laughs> What? I'm not sure you guys have it much better up there. <laughs> not really. I really, it's seen... so hard to trust anyone in politics because the whole system is broken. It's not just the people. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to go obviously long on politics, but have you, <laughs> have you seen uh, Robert Trudeau's brother, the one who drives the RFK bus around? He was driving it around the state. No. He was a big RFK supporter. Really? <laughs> and he's yeah, he's like Trudeau's brother. brother. Trudeau's half brother. Yeah, it's like okay. his half brother. I do I have heard of some of the things that he's said about him. <laughs> Negative things. Yeah. 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 I mean he's very nice about it. They're they, apparently they get along, yeah. but he doesn't agree with them. But you know, yeah. Well that's that's I know that's most, what it's supposed to be. A lot of my family doesn't agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> on like a yeah. lot of things. Sure, especially sure. like the whole sex work thing like this this whole thing with my memoir coming out is i didn't expect to feel this way but i am a little bit terrified okay yeah well i was okay. gonna yeah. well, good let's go back to this the fun stuff right yeah yeah Absolutely. and the sex work stuff so did, I, did you give your family a a copy as well to read ahead of time or no you, <laughs> no 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 Actually, that's mm. so funny. My son said to me uh, the other day, he, he's 19. He said, so, mom, uh, when should I read your, your memoir? Like, after you're dead? Because, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, you know, it's about sex work and the sex industry. And, you know, we we kind of already talked about before about how it might be uncomfortable for him to read it. Because I talk about mm-hmm. losing my virginity and, you know, being horny and and uh you know like, everything I, a son doesn't want yeah, to hear you don't want to think about your mother you know having sex and that kind of thing so i i just didn't know if he would be comfortable with it so i just warned him i said honestly if you want you can read it anytime like i sure. i'm not telling you not to i'm just warning you that yeah. you know it might not be comfortable for you to read it that's all and like i honestly kind of in some ways hope that my parents will read it but also in some ways hope that they don't it's just weird i don't know yeah 
Yeah, there's a lot of talk about you and your mother's relationship in the book. Mm-hmm. So I was curious, yeah, what what your how worried you are about her reading it and what you think the reaction will be when I mean, I would assume it she knows a lot of it at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, she knows I mean, she was there for the conflict, so she knows that you know, she knows about that. I don't know how much she knows about how it made me feel because sure. she's we've never talked it out weirdly. Okay. Um, and I think that's she's just she's the type of person that doesn't want to talk about stuff that is uncomfortable for her and and like when during covid when there was like big arguments in the family dinner table she would just shut the conversation down so as a as a for instance you know and uh she's always been the type that i i didn't know like did was she just pretending not to know that i was dancing or because it would be possible that she just didn't want to acknowledge it and face it yeah sure She'd yeah, rather she doesn't acknowledge it, it's it, it not doesn't happening. Happen. Yeah, yeah. A little out of sight, out of mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did, have you ever um, approached your mom and said, hey, mom, would you, you know, I would like to, maybe you don't, but I assumed you would want to talk about it. And has she ever just shut you down or just you haven't approached her? No, I mean, I've, I've tried to, one time I tried to plan a lunch with her and I was going to talk to her about my memoir. Uh, and we went for lunch and I mentioned that I was writing it, but she just didn't really seem that interested in the conversation. And, uh, I just didn't want to take it in that direction. It's our, our friend, our relationship is a bit fragile from everything. Mm -hmm. And I really like having her in my life and I, and I don't want to, I just don't want to have like a uncomfortable conversation. If she wants to, this is how I feel. If she wants to talk Mm -hmm. about it, then I would be happy to talk about it. But, like, she's never apologized for some of the things she said or did. But she said said things that sounded almost like an apology, you know, like telling me uh, on my birthday how proud of me she is, you know, and stuff like that. But never saying what she's proud of specifically, but... Just th- things yeah. that are kind of acknowledging that she does it, that she accepts me. And that's kind of where it is with her. Well, yeah. And I think that totally is her way of, uh, y- yeah, apologizing without apologizing. Yeah, without having that's, to that, acknowledge. That, isn't that maybe the best you ever it, get from her? It could be. And and like yeah. as long as, um, as long as she, that's fine with me, because I, I, I don't have like this this need to hash it out or uh or confront her or anything like that i actually actually writing my memoir helped me heal from a lot of that because at the age of 50 or or the last three years i've been writing it but late 40s and and 50 uh going over all of these things again from my older more mature perspective and i i could see it a lot more empathetically and and I can look at it like okay well my mom wasn't rejecting me like I thought she was actually doing what she thought was the best thing for me which was to try and force me to quit stripping by doing the only thing she could think of which was to withdraw her and withhold her love you know and and you learn that from your own parents like usually that kind of behavior comes from your own you know shitty upbringing so (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You, know, I, you could feel you could feel the growth of you throughout the book as the as the story went along, and and, and uh, I was thinking of as you're saying that the, the mantras that you learned from the Wayne Dyer book mm-hmm. about not being able to control others kind of I, I, that must be in your head as you're writing this down. Like I I, I don't know what's going to come of this, but all I can do is put out what I want to put out there, and now it's in the world and. Yeah. whatever happens happens yes that has been a part of like a part of this process which has only really kind of been happening since i started my lives <laughs> i started my lives i, I decided to do uh, a live every day for two weeks before i release my memoir and yeah. now it's a week in of lives and it's funny because a lot of the emotions i think i was suppressing them because i've been so busy but then when i have to stop and actually talk 
and there's no one answering me and I'm just talking. It's like all of a sudden I'm talking through, I'm hashing through all of these emotions and fears that I didn't even really realize like how, how strong they are. And, yeah. uh, and as I get closer and closer to the day, because like, I don't want to believe that anything terrible is going to happen because I'm re releasing the memoir, but there's fears, you know, I'm so impressed that you read my, that you read my book. <laughs> It's yeah, it's, well, it's I'm, I, I have uh, I, I have to fully admit I have the last two chapters left. So yeah, but, yeah, like like everybody, you know, like I procrastinate and procrastinate. <laughs> so I was I was reading furiously. That's really yesterday. good, though. That's pretty good. Two chapters left. But, and those two chapters are really basically like the last couple years of my life. And like what? Sure. And they were they had to be added, really. Most of the information had to be added because. When I was done writing it, suddenly a whole bunch of shit went sideways in my life. I had to get the surgery and then my relationship ended. And it's just been like so much stuff that I didn't anticipate happening. And then I'm like, this is pretty big stuff that needs to be included <laughs> before I release. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, but it is a cool way to bring out memoirs. I mean, a lot of them are people are settled in their life and whatever ready to coast off and then they could re go back but yours was happening as you go <laughs> I know. so you, you know gotta, it, it's you and, gotta and write them you... in one weekend and get them out on monday or otherwise they're out of date <laughs> that's what yeah, it felt I like think... <laughs> yes give it settled and then you can always write another now one because you got finally, a whole yeah exactly huge chapter ahead of you still i was thinking one day i'll release a client reveal a book all about my clients <sighs> There you go. Without any identifying information, of course, but just to sure, share like yeah. the the unique experiences that I had, uh, the the good, the bad, the ugly, mostly good, and yeah. uh, and yeah. I think yeah, from what I remember, you you had a lot of a good string of good luck with uh, a lot of your clients, yeah. which was nice. Well, I mean, it, well, it requires screening and creating advertising that attracts the type of client that you want, and being very ruthless in. Uh, rejecting the kind of clients you don't want you know it's and a lot of people would say that I, I have privilege to be able to say no and turn down clients that's that's something that especially in the sex industry people say that if you can turn them down then you have a you have privilege over sex workers who are more desperate and can't turn down the money sure but and you know I don't know that is kind of true but at the same time I'm a single mom on disability and sometimes I really need the money and I still turn down yeah. clients because I get a bad feeling. And I just, I feel yep. like I have to protect my safety because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do my work. And if I can't do my work, then I can't provide for my family. So, yeah. I mean, how many times you feel your, your, just your intuition saved you, you know, or yeah. from a bad experience. I'm not, I, I mean, don't want to go with extreme. <laughs> but, honestly, but. like. Just a bad experience. To be honest, like the majority of the guys that contact me, I don't even respond because they just, I, I, that's my first level of screening is how they contact me and how they speak to me. And then, uh, and then the next level is like a short conversation to, you know, get to know them a little bit. And if they say anything that's a little bit off in the booking process and they don't, um, send me like a face photo and stuff, I just, say i'm sorry like i had a guy uh ask me some invasive questions about my studio where i was going to give him a massage and it made me really uncomfortable i was like why are you instead of answering him i said why are you asking me this and he said it's because i've been ripped off before and hmm. like i mean i could be like oh poor guy like oh don't worry you don't have to worry about me this is and give him all my information but for whatever reason i felt uncomfortable with what he said and how he said it and uh, I said to, and I and then I also don't like that because I my ideal client is someone who is thoughtful in their booking process and will actually look me up check out my socials check out whether I'm legitimate whether they can trust me and I have such a prolific online presence that if you don't know that I'm safe by checking me out, then you haven't done your research, then I don't want you as a client. Yeah. And so yeah, I, sure. I said to him after he said that, I just said, you know what? I don't feel comfortable going through with this uh, booking mm. anymore. And, uh, and he said, 
his response was, fuck you. <laughs> I think, right, made, I think you made the right, right choice. Yep. <laughs> right, right. I think you made the right yep. choice there. That one's a good one. Or good choice there. Right? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, but uh, how hard was that when you were starting out? Starting out, to... I mean, I had to have a bad experience to get better at screening. And my bad experience was sure. uh, a guy showed up and he had like really bad anxiety. And I thought he was just nervous because that, that happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. But he was really focusing on the fact that my landlord was sitting in the uh, lobby of the building. And he seemed really concerned that somebody had seen him come in and was like so crazy paranoid. Uh, and it, he instantly gave me like that sick gut feeling, you know, like and, and I felt like I didn't know how to handle it. I was trying to be empathetic. But at the same time, I, I had like my my radar going and. Um, he, he decided he wanted to leave and I was like, okay, that's fine. And I actually even messaged him right after he left and said, I hope you're okay. Cause I was like, whoa, like this guy's <laughs> freaking out. Um, and then after he'd been gone for a few minutes, I started to like calm down and realize that I had been having that gut feeling. I didn't recognize it at the time. And I was just, it, I'd never been in this situation before. I'd never had someone behave this way. And uh, once I calmed down, I started to realize how sketchy his behavior had been. And I started to think, oh, my God, I wonder if he was going to do something. And he was all freaked out because somebody saw his face when he walked through the door. And I don't know, but like something was just off. And sure enough, uh, about an hour later, I start getting these harassing messages from him about um, my disgusting building and my landlord and uh, just started like trash talking me and my and just weird, stupid shit about my building. And and then I was like, OK, this guy is obviously mm. and I just blocked him a little out there. Yeah. So this happened like, OK, about six years ago. That's when I started doing massages. And now I still get messages from this guy almost every time I post my ad. He still reaches oh, out wow. and he'll, he'll pretend he's going to book with me. And then I ask for the, sc the screening process. And then he'll send something about my landlord or about the building or about or something <laughs> like it's just something that gives it away who he is. And I'm just like, <laughs> wow. Wow, that is like that's dedication right there. Not letting go. Wow, but that's that mental is, illness, yeah. you know, and that's that's yeah. why this work you do have to be so careful about. And then, and then, like I teach in the business bible um, that I wrote, there's a whole chapter on controlling a session, and a lot of that is about de-escalation, managing the the client in a way that doesn't anger them, and doesn't upset them, and doesn't make them feel judged or anything um even if you're just so like like mad at them because they're pushing boundaries or scared or anything just to really like bring things down control the session until you can get them safely out the door and then take notes on them get a rating system on them and make sure you never take them back again and that's you know even just simple things like that that a lot of uh new people in the industry they don't take they might not take notes or they might not uh, remember somebody when they they contact them again and then they're faced with the same asshole you know so yeah absolutely yeah now you guys you you created the, the website the naked truth mm -hmm. and uh in a, an online forum and, and place for uh strippers to go and it's expanded since and i'm curious do you as a as a massage do you guys like sex workers do you guys pass that information on to each other like if you get a client who's a something like this do you like alert everybody watch else hey for. watch out for this guy well there are there are like blacklists there's um there are communities of sex workers that if there's someone who's violent uh we do try to share that information yeah. for instance like even if uh, a po social media post is going around of a sex offender that's recently been uh released from jail we'll share that in the groups and uh and we share we share like um People will go in, especially new people will ask questions and we always share information with each other on how to work safely and how to manage different situations. And 
I accessed those groups very extensively, like early on doing massages. And now I'm one of the people who's trying, who tries to return the favor by helping other people as much as possible. But I still learn a lot in there all the time. Yeah. So it's going well. And if I remember last time, you, I shouldn't say you worked with the police, but kind of got them off your back. So far, they haven't so, arrested us. <laughs> so, okay. So that's still going, which is the way it should be. But um, it's, it's good to hear it's still going well. We actually, oh, I don't know if I should yeah. say this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course you can. We're old friends. We, we tried <laughs> to get, uh, we're, we're, we're putting on a panel for my book launch day. It's It was a coordinated collaborative event between my fellow coalition members who are also Naked Truth uh, colleagues and and myself, my Annie, Te- Annie Temple brand, to have this panel event and uh, celebrate the launch of my book on the same day. And the panel event is called the uh, the War Against Erotic Entrepreneurs, A Working Class Crisis, because we do feel that it is a working class crisis. And some of the things that my colleague Susan Davis will be talking about, things like housing exclusion, like how you can get kicked out of your place if you, they find out that you're a sex worker and how it's written right into our rental agreements that uh, you can't be a sex worker and live in the in the, that building. And uh, mm-hmm. that is actually illegal because they say that in Canada, sex work is legal. And so it's illegal to evict people for a, a legal occupation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so right. so that's sure. one way that we're b- being discriminated against. Uh, and it's, you know, it's very scary when you could be kicked out of your home, especially if your parent And then there's other ways, like, for instance, uh, I tried to sell my books and my webinars on my website, and I tried to uh, connect a payment uh, portal, but I can't get a payment portal. None of the companies will allow me to sell my books or my webinars because they say that I am outside of their... um, community stand not community standards but whatever their terms are that they use their conditions their terms and conditions because i work in the sex industry so even just saying that i like having a book called how sex work shaped my life and and business bible for erotic entrepreneurs because of the names of the books they won't allow me to and, and i'm like well what if i really wanted to get out of sex work and i was using this to try right. and get out and they're they're blocking my ability to get paid in another way you know yeah it's, they don't know if your book that's that, so weird you know how, how sex life shaped or how sex work shaped my life they don't know if it ends with you being out of sex work maybe you're maybe the book is all about how it's maybe they should let you sell i know i know <laughs> to, to meet their values i mean they don't <laughs> that doesn't make any sense yeah, so that it, so we it, call it that financial exclusion and some sex workers have been denied uh business bank accounts um also been debanked had you know been kicked out of banks because of their work different and and weird things are happening too where uh people are getting limitations put on their accounts just because they're flagged and they're flagged based on uh conditions that have been identified as uh uh probable sex work behavior you know like sending multiple um e-transfers or accepting multiple e-transfers or stuff like that and so this one woman uh that susan davis knows is sending money home to her family in another country (laughs) And had her, and she's gorgeous, and she dresses really, you know, stunning. And uh, she probably has no idea that they're probably doing it because they think she's a sex worker, even though she's not. You know. When, when are you when are you going to move yourself to the land of the truly free? Right. <laughs> what is that, Texas? <laughs> well, there you go. Now, what's funny is. Texas claims to be that, but they're also the one where they, they ban Pornhub. Yeah. So it's, you know. That's my biggest you're, you're problem. Okay. I'm like, and you probably got that from my book. I'm so in the middle of like, I, I feel like a binary system just doesn't work. Why do we have to be hate? Like if we're on the right, then we hate sex workers and trans. And if we're on the, the left, then we hate uh, guns and 
church or something. I don't know. But like, it's just like, you can't like, what about those of us who believe in God, own a gun and think that parents deserve to have medical rights over their own children? <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. And like, like I mean, yeah, we keep going back to politics, but like talk, most people are that way. Most people are in the middle. I know, most, right? I mean, you know, that's why I <laughs> loved when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was running uh, because his platform really spoke to me in the way of addressing like the the corruption and addressing health issues in children. And the, those are things that are so close to my heart as a mother and as someone who's been through a lot of medical trauma. So that. Oh. And that's how I found him. He want, he wanted to fix problems. He didn't want to just yeah. coast with them. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. He And he still does want to fix problems. Mm -hmm. so. He does. Yeah. He really does. He, he I mean, he it seems to me that he believes that he can trust Trump. And I guess we'll have to see what happens if Trump gets in. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Either way, but yeah. So, so we have you. Do you know anybody that has been kicked out of their apartment oh. because of? Well, yeah, um, it's been an issue clause. for some people. Yes, it's been used against people uh, because our network of sex worker activists stretches across Canada. Well, it stretches all over the earth, but um, but in Canada specifically, we've been talking a lot about housing exclusion and. and there was even housing conferences and stuff going on that we've been trying to uh, penetrate and get in there and, and get our agenda on their agenda and that kind of thing. So it's, it's been, it's been very interesting. I mean, that's, that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about at the panel is all of this kind of yeah. exclusion of sex workers and discrimination against uh, legal, a legal occupation. Right. And, uh, and then we're, we're going to try to, uh address this whole also part of sex work that most people ignore that men work in the sex industry too and uh because a lot of the rhetoric that makes people feel entitled to stigmatize sex workers is that it's exploitation of women by men and yeah. when you say oh. that you're completely ignoring the fact that there's men who work in the sex industry Absolutely. You know, and I mean, and if you ask some sex workers, we would say, you know, that it's the men being exploited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, darn them. Darn it. I mean, I, I always try to be nice. Are you sure you want to come back and see me every week? <laughs> Get expensive. <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, well, let's go. No, I lost what I was going. I had it. I had it. No, no, I want to, because I think the one thing that we really didn't go deep on when we had you on the last time was I, I didn't realize how uh, extensive your medical troubles were. And, and, and I didn't realize you were nearly on the verge of death at one point and that we, we almost weren't able to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, the, the terms that I, I had never heard the term vaccine injury before. Mm -hmm. And and I'm and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that and and how that went into your what what ended up being your your, your medical issue. Sure. So I mean I'm I was like everybody I I got all my my kids all their vaccines and whenever I was uh, sorry I had a fly flying around me here. <laughs> <laughs> He's been in my house for a week. I need to get him. So you're waving <laughs> at me. It's like one. You're just or, waving wait, at everybody. <laughs> You're in Canada, isn't so? Uh, isn't it cold enough the flies are all dead by now? It's no, not October. where I am. I'm, it's just raining right now. It's still pretty warm uh, out. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I totally just went along with what uh, we were taught about vaccines being safe and effective. Never ever questioned them. When my kids were little, I had one dear friend who decided not to vaccinate her child and. When I asked her about it, she said that she just didn't think he needed to have them. And I thought, yeah. okay, whatever. Like, I didn't judge her. I didn't. But I thought, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to vaccinate my kids because I thought it was the right thing to do. It was the safest thing to do. And I honestly didn't think that anyone would ever hurt babies, would ever intentionally hurt babies. Right. So I just, I, I, I thought if they say they're safe, then they must be. And then, so here we are, I'm 34 years old now. I've got a couple of young kids and 
uh, it's recommended in my my job. I was working in a transition house at the time to get the Hep A B shot, which is it was Twin Rix is the the name of it, but um, it's basically for hepatitis hepatitis A and B. It's a combination okay. shot, and you're supposed to get three shots in the round. And after my first shot, I actually started having gastrointestinal issues, but at the time didn't even think it could be from the vaccine because I thought vaccines were completely safe. Trusted the vaccine. I had, no. It would never have occurred to me even. Uh, but after the second shot, I started to have uh, even more severe issues. And my husband at the time said to me, could this be from the vaccine? And I went to my doctor who had administered the vaccine and said, could, could all my health problems that have suddenly happened be from the vaccines? And he said, oh, no, 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 it couldn't be from the vaccines, which is a complete, of course not. it's no, either a lie yeah, they're or pay, they're paying him to, <laughs> he's either he like, honestly, he's sure. either like never read a vaccine insert, which listed all of my symptoms or, <laughs> or he's lying, which is just shocking to me, you know? So anyway, so on went years of health issues and doctors and specialists and no one could help me. And it wasn't until. I decided to try and take some control of my own health and change my diet that I started to have some improved symptoms because it turns yeah. out that vaccines cause an autoimmune response. And uh, when you have an autoimmune, when your immune system is activated, it, it can attack pretty much anything in your body, not just the virus that's introduced with the vaccine. And so when your body's in that hyper auto, like hyper immune state, it can start to react to things like the food that's in your body, the food that you're eating while your body is like dealing with all this toxic shit in there, you know, and and what happened is I developed multiple food allerg allergies without knowing it. And so I was just eating the same diet and I was constantly, constantly sick. And when I changed my diet and got rid of a lot of those trigger foods, my symptoms improved really dramatically, but they didn't. I wasn't healed. I still continued to have gastrointestinal problems, which culminated into an emergency about four years after the vaccine. Uh, but yeah, but like those problems were ongoing. It was like a roller coaster. But um, when that happened, and this is the crazy thing at the time, I thought there had to be something that caused it, you know, and I was trying to think, what did I do? Right. Because I had by then realized that what caused the first you know, decline, serious decline in health was the vaccine. Uh, but then I didn't realize that it could just continue to create damage and, and more damage and more damage. Because what happens when, when your gastrointestinal system gets completely out of balance with the microbiome, it can just continue to get worse and worse and snowball. And even though I was eating quite healthy, I... I didn't, I wasn't detoxing fast enough. I wasn't healing my intestine fast enough. And I don't even know if I would have been able to heal it because I mean, like the story goes on and on forever and until I finally ended up just last year getting rid of my whole large intestine. But at that time I had an emergency surgery, 75% of my large intestine removed. And, and then that started years of uh, so many different autoimmune conditions. So when people... When people are sick, when people have autoimmune conditions, what I immediately think now is that they may have had a vaccine injury. Sure. Um, but whether or not that's what caused their problem, that the me medications that they're on are making them sicker. Because that's yeah. what happened to me. Because the surgeries and the medications and the antibiotics, I went from just having gastrointestinal problems to having full-blown arthritis in every single joint in my body and all kinds of other health problems because medications don't heal you you know they just make you thicker right. and sicker so then so then I launched on like a real purposeful uh I learned about the vaccines later when when I did my research I did research because it was coming I was so sick of the medical system I was so sick of doctors I didn't trust them anymore because of everything I'd been through I mean, they treated me like I was, it was all in my head until I lost my intestine, you know? Yep. And, then, Jeez. And, then, and then probably woke you up and said, it's still in your head. Yeah, no, th then, <laughs> then, they took, then they took me, my health issues seriously, but then they cornered me in my hospital bed trying to coerce me into taking immune suppressant drugs. 
And by then I was so terrified to take any kind of medication. And honestly, almost any medication I ever tried, I would break out in hives and I would react to because that's how sick my body was. Wow. So I, I was terrified to try and take their drugs because when I researched uh, immune suppressant drugs uh, by talking to other people that I did research them, but I find the best way to research is to talk to people who are on the drugs. Yeah. And so I went in. Go to the source. Yeah. I went into Crohn's forums on Facebook yes. and asked questions. And the majority of the people who were on the immune suppressant drugs were still in and out of the hospital. Like my doctor was basically saying, if I wanted to have a normal life again, I would have to go on those drugs. And I just was so resistant to that idea. So I instead thought there are people who have healed naturally and I want to be one of those people. So I just became committed to finding a way to heal naturally. And I largely got my life back. Like I don't have arthritis anymore. I found the right natural supplements to uh, detox my body a lot. But the one thing that I I was unable to do no matter how hard I tried was to heal what was left of my large intestine. So sure. when they, they took 75% in 2012 and then um, left like just my sigmoid colon and my rectum. And that part of my large intestine just continued to be diseased. And it was just managing it for the next 10 years with my health going like this. And then finally last year, it just got to a point where it had to be dealt with. So I ended up getting a permanent ostomy, which is a poop bag on my stomach. And now I am, I'm an ostomilf. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> there's definitely a category for that there i think go. i'm i think i'm the one who made that category yeah there you go yeah you should you should probably trademark and patent that thing right now <laughs> right because <laughs> you wear it you, 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 you wear it loud and proud and that's as you should thank you you know it took seeing a lot of other people who were willing to share photos of themselves with their bag showing and yeah and now it's become empowering for me to do that. It's still like weird. Like I won't go, I, I wear high waisted bathing suit and my bag will poke out a little bit at the bottom, but, uh, I like, I'm not comfortable just to like walk around with it hanging out. Like I know there are some people out yeah. in the world who do that. I'm not that person, but I didn't want to stop doing lingerie photos. I didn't want to stop doing nude photos. I didn't want yeah. to stop doing intimacy work. And I really feared that I wouldn't be able to do any of those things, that, that people would find me repulsive and that I wouldn't be uh, marketable anymore. So, so I can actually honestly say I'm 50-year-old woman with wrinkles, a poop bag, scars, no <laughs> belly button. <laughs> and people still pay to spend time with me and see me naked. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Well, that's part of your growing, right? And just part of your um, your whole journey to not uh, let other people dictate what you're going to do with your life. And here you are talking about it to thousands of people and loud and proud. And uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of you. And I think it's so uh, wonderful that you do that. Thank you so much. That really means a lot. I uh, another, another... And sexy as ever. Oh, I thank you. Yeah, because and that's another kind of hope that my book will a way that I hope my book will impact people is people who are insecure about their bodies to be able to learn how I overcame my own insecurities. And there was work involved. It's not like I just miraculously right. came through it thinking I'm hot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I. I yeah, the first sure. time I had my large intestine, my 75% of my large intestine removed, I had an ostomy for four months. And during that time, I hated myself. And I was disgusted by myself. I wouldn't sure. leave the house. I cried all the time. I wanted to kill myself if they didn't remove that bag. That's how yeah. how bad it was. And so to be able to come through it this time with uh, the attitude that I can do anything now and my life is better because of the bag that's just such a huge huge uh growth as you say and it did take a lot of work on myself to to be able to get there but but another thing people don't realize and i talk about this when uh, when i go on sex worker podcasts because uh, i want to know am i the only one because i don't think so but 
I feel like, at least for me and for probably for a lot of sex workers and many that I've talked to, being in the adult entertainment industry has actually made us more confident about our bodies and more body secure mm. than most of the, we call them civilian women, <laughs> most of the like <laughs> civilian women <laughs> um, that we know. And we feel like, you know, when you're, when you're burying yourself uh, all the time and, and people are accepting you the way you are, you, you just, you naturally become very comfortable with, with your body. And it's, yeah. And this work in that way has been such a wonderful, wonderful thing for like my confidence and my, and like anytime I've started to feel down or, or feel insecure, uh, the, the acceptance, love and, you know, being treated like I'm desirable and beautiful. Uh, the fact that I thought I was going to lose all my clients and they're all still here. Uh, just those kinds of things make me realize not just that I'm beautiful, but that mm -hmm. uh, that people aren't as shallow as we we think they are. People, you know, we need to give people more credit, men, especially men, more credit because they're not just objectifying us. They're not just looking for the right body to to spend time with the, the personality, uh, the connection, the conversation, all of that stuff matters. And I obviously have made my clients feel close enough to me and caring enough to me that they don't care about the bag and they I mean they still think I'm sexy as fuck <laughs> excellent well and and it wasn't an easy journey so no. for anybody out there listening and they're the, like well similar any similar struggles I couldn't do it as quickly as Annie did well it wasn't quick well, right I mean it, it 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 was some time and you got to Got to stick with it and it will turn on the end. Yeah. And anyone with the, any body the, can be beautiful and feel beautiful. That's the most. Yeah. Yeah, every, every, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is interesting because your, your style of writing that the book does move along at a nice pace and it, and it feels, you forget that it is the length of time that it is, you know, it, it reads yeah, so sure. quickly and it read. I mean, it's so entertaining that you're like, this must've happened all within like six months, but this is happening over, over the course of quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So 25, yeah. 27 years. Yeah. It's still going. <laughs> well, and, and I was going to ask you about, cause you dedicated the book to you, which I assume is cause we're reading it. Whoever is reading it, yeah. which was, you don't see that often. So that was, that was a nice touch, but is that what, what made you dedicate it? Because, well, I mean, in all complete honesty, it was because I wrote it during COVID and I just was so heartbroken by how much division there was in our society. And I found that the one safe place that I had to go to was my massage studio. And in that space, one-on-one, -on -one, like like 99% of my clients were, were jabbed as they say, and I was unjabbed yeah. <laughs> and, and yet we never ever had any kind of problems, arguments. Uh, and, and some of them were very staunchly firm about the whole vaccine uh, issue, mm -hmm. but were able to um, um, open their minds because they were in this situation with facing this person that they cared about and that they, believed in and I could articulate my position and and they could understand like okay she almost died from a vaccine obviously she's not comfortable getting a vaccine and they could accept that you know <laughs> um and then when but they couldn't accept it with other people and so then I would be like well how do you know they don't know someone who had a vaccine injury or how do you know that yeah. that there isn't something in their history that's brought them to that decision but everybody has a history that brings them to the decisions that they make. And if you know that history, often you can understand it and be more open-minded and less judgmental. And so when I was writing my memoir, I kept thinking about how if, you know, I, I, I was like the double whammy of being like an unjabbed sex worker. I was not just a <laughs> sex worker and I was not just unjabbed. I was like all of the above and how, uh, how if I could get people to understand and relate to me through my story, then I could help heal division in our society yeah. and not just with mm. those specific topics. But if, if you could grow to uh, understand one person who's had that uh, 
you know, those many drastic different experiences and made those many unpopular decisions. <laughs> um, and then maybe you can open your mind to accept other people too. And so when I dedicate it to you, the reader, it's because I really want the reader to be impacted by the book and actually even maybe feel a little bit changed by the time they're done reading it. Well, I, I enjoyed reading it for, for one reason. I was one of the believers. I, I got vaccinated. Okay. Um, I got the first booster and then started to get educated and I haven't been boosted since. Um, but it was, it was interesting to read your chapter and to, to hear it from somebody who had gone through what you had gone through and, and understanding why you weren't willing to do it again. Okay. And, 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 you know, because I knew, and I, you know, I proudly say I was not one of these, but I did know people that wouldn't have anything to do with somebody who didn't get vaccinated, mm -hmm. wouldn't be in the same room with them. Yeah. And, uh, it's sad to me that, that, you know, that, that is what we live with now that, that, yeah, I think people it's still to there do. too. Like I, and I it's think it there, went yeah. the other way too, like not just with the people who got vaccinated and became, um, um intolerant of the unvaccinated but the other way around the people who didn't get vaccinated became so triggered and so uh yeah. angry and a lot of them are still carrying that they're still carrying yeah. that anger you know and oh, yeah. it's just like it just it really breaks my heart honestly because as someone who who I believe in choice. I honestly just believe in choice. I believe in informed consent and I think that everyone should have had that which I don't think yep. we do. I don't think we have that with any no. of the vaccines, not just the COVID ones. Uh, yeah. But I do believe that everyone should have the choice and that we should all respect each other's choices. So that, that was yeah. the greatest tragedy to me was how people weren't respecting each other's decisions. You know, even right. screaming, like I went to a rally, like a freedom rally, we called it, you know. And, you know, some of the people would be screaming at, other, at people on the sidelines who were wearing masks take off your mask and i was just like oh i don't want to be associated with these hateful people like i didn't want to be associated yeah. with hate on either side of it because that right. that wasn't where i was coming from you know i knew sex workers who wouldn't take clients who were vaccinated and i knew sex workers who wouldn't take clients who were unvaccinated it was just <laughs> uh it was just the craziest time and it's a crazy time and like in my book you, you i took tried any to... client who had a loony or a toonie yeah <laughs> and did did you like just wondering because you read that part did you like understand like the terror because i felt like i i felt like i really lost my mind during covid and in fear of my government and like i had to get a gun and i had to learn to garden i mean i didn't know are they going to take away my driver's license like like i i just went crazy in fear of the government you know that and it was just i feel like a lot of people who went along with the mandates could it not understand the terror of standing up against them, you know? Right. And so that was part of what I was trying to demonstrate in the book of how, like, I feel like we all went a little mentally ill then, you know, because yeah. it was just so ridiculously out of our realm of contact, every single one of us, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Matt, yeah. And it's like you said, no matter what you believed and what you did and what you, we all suffered from, yes. it. We, we all did. The and, children uh, the most. Yeah, That's I know. True. And I know my kid was full. Well, she was uh, in pre-K when it started. Oh. So she was going into kindergarten. So her kindergarten year was fully masked. Oh. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. The saddest part was they wouldn't allow you to educate others and, and to, to, to get educated with, mm -hmm. with everything. Yeah. The sense of you know, that, that, that to me was the saddest part. You know, you couldn't have a choice if you didn't, couldn't hear you couldn't get educated on both sides. Well, you know, this episode probably YouTube probably, probably won't let us put this out. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, yeah. Not anymore. That's right. I've seen a lot of people. You can't say the V word. <laughs> too That's late. Right. We already said it too many times. Oh, yeah. You guys. It doesn't matter. It no, doesn't it doesn't matter. matter. But um, I'm sorry, guys. I mean, it, it's, it's a great conversation <laughs> no. and it's a great topic. And it, and it and, uh, needs to be talked about. I do think but, it uh, does need to be talked about more now that I feel, I feel like now we've had enough time that we can start to talk about it. We can start to heal as a society, absolutely. you know, and start to bridge those. those. Um, I had a client today and he, he, he was fully jabbed. That's fine. He, he got five of them. And he also knew that I didn't. And 
he's even read my memoir like he but he just believes in vaccines and that's and I respect that that's fine but I I am so terrified of them that he told me today that he's going to get the flu vaccine on Friday and I literally begged him not to (laughs) I was like I was like, I d- I'm sorry, I just really care about you. And I just, I don't trust the pharmaceuticals. And did you know that flu vaccines have mercury in them? <laughs> and I'm just like trying to convince him. Did you know the flu is not that bad? You're sick for a couple days. It's, well, no. Exactly. It's not that bad. Maybe, yeah. maybe boost up your little vitamins a few, you know, and, yeah. and just Well, and that was out. like one of the things that wasn't widely uh, uh, shared during COVID and never is every year, but just simply vitamin D can prevent yeah. the flu. It's just yeah. insane, you know? I take it. Yeah, you do. Anyway. <laughs> I take the D. You take the D? Ooh. Wait, what? What? Wait, can we can we, <laughs> can we change subjects and talk about uh, mullet pussy? <laughs> <laughs> We don't. We Let's don't want this thing to be beat around the bush. Yeah, we don't want this thing to be all and deep and get right to the. Because when you open the you open the table of contents, the first thing that sticks out to you is a chapter called mullet pussy. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> I mean, out of the out of the twenty chapters, that's the one that. Yes. You kind of draw to. What is mullet pussy? <laughs> okay, well, I'll I'll define it and then I'll tell you how how. <laughs> How that has to do with me. So a mullet (laughs) pussy is that one that is all trimmed up in the front, you know, but (laughs) has not been trimmed in the back, you know, like you're where your butt is and all that and underneath. (laughs) Okay, so 100% what do you you expect? Go ahead. (laughs) So this is shocking to me now. Like, and it's so funny. I never really thought about it until I started uh, doing these interviews. Because a few people have asked me about mullet pussy. <laughs> but, uh, but I realized I had never looked at my vagina before I became a stripper. I had never taken out a mirror and stuck it between my legs and looked at it. And that just blows my mind because, I mean, guys are lucky. You, you look down and there it is. You grow up, you can see your dick. We stare at it all right? day long. Yeah, we stare we at do. it, play with it, you know? <laughs> But girls, like we we can't see what's going on down there. We we can see like kind of the outer, and that's it. And yeah. and I have an innie, so I really like can't see nothing, you know. Um, but so... I, I I I do want to talk about your, the the name that you gave your put. But I'm going to make people read. We're not going to tell people what you have named your pussy okay. because that I have it is so on. clever. It is so clever. And I'm like, we're not going to spoil that. Go read the book. <laughs> it's worth it's worth it. Yeah, that's funny. And it's a, <laughs> yeah, so I showed up to my first night stripping, and I had shaved the bikini area in front, but I had not shaved <laughs> the underneath or the back. So I had a mullet pussy, but I didn't know. And so I worked all night, and I I did a lot of dances that night, okay? And I worked, I made like, I think it was $300 in four hours, and that was more than I was making two weeks at my job. So... I was like uh, showing it off, <laughs> and then the next night I went into work again, and the girl very, very kindly and nicely told me that I needed to that I should shave it all, or you know, at that time they there was nobody just leaving it all, so I yeah. don't know if they do that now, but back then nobody left it all. So and if they left any, it was in the front, not the back. <laughs> <laughs> But to be fair, as well, you said, you made three hundred dollars in four hours your first night. The guys didn't care. We, we really don't care. They probably well, just went hours. back the to the night, table so... and, and spread through the bar that there was a girl there with a mullet and seen him. <laughs> I don't know. But the funny thing is, like, a few years later, I wrote a poem about it called "Mullet." Yes, Pussy. you did. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and then that poem was actually published in a uh, sex worker zine in the downtown east side of Vancouver, and it became I became infamous for that poem, and I like to the point where I'd be walking down the street and I would hear, "Mullet <laughs> I know it was for me. <laughs> I, you you're like I can take credit for that. I don't even need to look around. I know. Uh, yeah. Yep. Well, I would, you know, That's take me. a bow. <laughs> yeah, right. 
That'd be a great name for a band. It would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, and then, and then when I finally, you know, when you start dancing, you learn from the other dancers that you do have to look in the mirror to check down there for toilet sure. paper because toilet paper, if it's stuck, will glow in the black lights and it'll look like ah, your tampon yes. sticking out or it'll look like, you have no idea what it looks like, but it doesn't look good. So then I started, ha you know, making sure I was looking in the mirror and then I was kind of shocked at what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh. And we're not, and again, we're not going to tell. <laughs> no clues on the name. <laughs> no clues. But so good. Um, I mean, I I don't want to get off mullet pussy. I, wanted, <laughs> I just don't know. What else we could talk about it? <laughs> what? Well, that, oh, go ahead. No, I was so, just going to say the poem, mullet pussy, the poem is in the book. Uh -huh. And uh, not only that, oh. there are, there are other poems in between each of the chapters or, or like some letters or something. Uh -huh. There's there's like little intermissions between the chapters that are so a lot of your poetry is is in there. Yeah. It was relevant. I tried to make a, a poem or letter or uh, I even have press release and oh, yeah. I have yeah. transcript from um, a video recording at the beginning of I think the last chapter. So uh, yeah, it was it was to to complement what was in the book and tried to tried to yeah. put stuff that was relevant for each chapter and and actually i recorded my audio book and when i put that together the transcript instead of just reading the transcript i found the audio recording and just cleaned it up and put it in so you can hear the actual audio recording so that's kind of cool oh nice okay and i just found out that audible approved my book so i don't have to make any oh. edits Honestly, Yay! recording an audiobook and get it to the like to the detail they need it to be to make it approved is probably one of the most difficult goals I've ever achieved. And I yeah. just oh. so relieved and proud of myself. I'm like, yes, I did it. That's awesome. Did you re did you record the audiobook like where you're sitting? Yes. Nice. I okay. actually I uh, put up an umbrella and a blanket over it to create like a almost like a podcast booth or a, or a recording booth and and then i got up at like four in the morning every day because i have neighbors upstairs that can be really noisy sometimes and i didn't know if it would affect the recording mm. and then i and it's so hard when you wake up in the morning you start talking and your voice is all croaky and you're like oh god <laughs> but but i also, some happened. of the some wow. of the books earlier recordings are kind of sexy from that graggly voice. Yeah, and maybe. Voice. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, so, which chapter did you find was the easiest to write, and you just didn't want to stop? And the other one where you're like, uh, I'll finish that later, and it, you that one you might have procrastinated mm, a little bit. That's a good question. Or, I know the hardest one was the naked okay. truth. The chapter about the naked truth was the hardest chapter for me to write. And I put it off the longest. Okay. It was like just stressing me out because there's so much to say. And like what I put in the book is such a small amount of what has gone on with the naked truth. And I wanted to, I just wanted, I wanted to write it in a way that all of the people who were involved would feel like honored by what I wrote but I also feared that I might get some of it wrong and because so many people were involved in so much of it it's very possible that I did and so uh, at the very beginning of that chapter I actually say I apologize if I got anything wrong because the, sure. the years of illness really did fuck with my memory like it's been sure. it's been hard to get it back like the vaccine injury itself uh I went from being someone who was so like on it, like my brain worked so well. Like I was a straight A student all through my whole schooling life. And when I had the vaccine injury in 2008, I couldn't copy and paste something without going back and re and undoing and rereading like three, four or five times because I would forget what I was doing. Like my brain oh. did not work anymore properly. And when I cleaned up my diet, it helped a lot, but it's never been completely the same again yeah okay so when you did the audiobook 
was reading that a second time, like you had to write it the first time. Now you're reading it. Was that easier to do or e even harder? <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh, you guys. Okay, so editing the book, I edited it so many times and every time I edited it and then I had to add another chapter and then I broke up with, you know, my relationship ended and now I'm like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> so it, it was just like a constant reliving of experiences over and yeah. over. And I thought that I kind of had... Uh, desensitized myself to a lot of it because I edited that damn book so many times and then and then I still sent out a copy to everyone that needed editing <laughs> so I had to edit it again <laughs> but uh, but the audiobook was speaking everything out loud was very different it it, it was re-traumatizing right. re in all honesty and there are parts of the book when people listen to it that they might be able to tell that I was actually holding back tears because sure. it was just so like so hard to remember like when when my husband's family rejected me and thought that I was faking yeah. my illness and uh when when my I couldn't pick up my two-year-old anymore put her yeah. on my lap and like I, I came home from the hospital and we had to take her we had to get rid of her crib and put her in a bed because I wouldn't be able to lift her in and out of the crib anymore and ju just so many things that impacted my family because of my health that was a big part of it and and then also uh you know COVID wasn't that long ago so no. that was really like reliving that I like I got a little teary-eyed remembering some of the the emotions that I went through during that time as well so yeah. it was definitely super emotional to to uh record the audiobook and I was just so relieved when I found out yesterday that I don't have to do any more recording. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I like when this sure. is over, I'm never going to talk about the, no, I am just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you right the next one. Yeah. So then let's, let's make a happy note, which was the funnest chapter to read out loud. Oh, uh, what was the funnest? I mean, there were parts in the book where I had to like cut out my laughing when I when I edited it because sure, it was so sure. funny. But like definitely the chapters where I was talking about like the time that everyone in the lineup did mushrooms. <laughs> I I have that written down because I agreed with it so much when you said 18 minutes on mushrooms feels like an eternity, especially when you're dancing. And I'm like, yes, 18 minutes on mushrooms feels like an eternity. I so I can it. only imagine. I cannot <laughs> believe we got through that. Looking back now, I mean, I would never do something like that. Honestly, looking back at my book, the amount of, uh, of stories I have about doing mushrooms, I didn't even realize I did mushrooms that much in my life. And then I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> huh were you somebody who journaled a lot or did or yeah. did you have to rely okay so you had a lot of this written down and were able to uh, pull from yes that? i well i mean i did look back at my journals but i didn't use a lot of it what was in my okay. journals and the reason why is because i usually journaled when i was angry or upset and so it was very emotional uh uh not like it, 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 I wouldn't have been able to really give the correct context if I if I used that stuff because now I can like I said I can tell you the whole story and give you all the different angles whereas at, in those moments when I was journaling all I saw was my own pain or anger or fear and I couldn't really tell sure. the big story in those situations you know so yeah. for instance I would have like an um, I'd be sitting in the bar between shows writing about how the DJ uh told me that I'm lucky I didn't get fired I was going to get fired because my boobs are too small but he talked them out of it and I would just be like trash talking the DJ about <laughs> f you loser and like just horrible <laughs> things about the DJ and yeah. and it was just because I was just you know I was hurt by the fact that they wanted to fire me because of my boobs but also like don't tell me then you know, or right. I don't know, or like, why are you trying to like, I don't know, anyway, but, but, you yeah. know, you're young, you're immature, you're emotional, and and you're writing it all down. Yeah, yeah well, that, that's interesting. Yeah, but it's a great point that it and it's probably beneficial not to because it is one sided one anger sided. Mm -hmm. So and like, for instance, someday you maybe you can go back and read them and, and laugh through them. 
Well, yeah, but also realize how far I've come. Sure. Because like when I wrote my book, I didn't remember that. I didn't when I read when I went through my journal and read that, I didn't even remember that. Like I it was that minuscule of an event in my life that I didn't even remember that. I remembered another time when I did get fired because my boobs were small, (laughs) but I didn't remember the time I almost got fired. You know what I mean? So I and on and honestly, when people tell you things like that, sometimes you don't even know whether it's true. Like they could just be saying that just to fuck with you, you know? Right. So and like people are like that weirdly. Yeah. There are all kinds out there. (laughs) That was one of the harder things for me to learn as I as I grew older was that there are people who will purposely try to mess with you you know and and it's a hard lesson but once you learn it it, you don't unlearn it (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) well yeah and hopefully people can learn from it you know they don't let it keep happening to them over and over again but and read your book and they can maybe learn from it Mm -hmm. and i think the biggest lesson is you can't control what other people think of you true you can only control one thing or even their actions it's only one thing we have any of us have control over and it's our own minds and people think people think what do you mean when i say to them well you know when you start thinking about that stop but i can't stop well actually no it's the only thing you can do is stop your own mind no one can do that except you and there's nothing else in the world that we have control over except for the way we think about what's happening around us. Yeah, That's it. Well, thank you so much for putting your story into the world. I hope that um, a lot of people read it. Um, I, it's, it's, it's very entertaining. Like I said, it's a, it, it, it moves quickly. Like it, it, you, you get pulled into the story and, uh, and, and you feel like you're, you're living it with you. And, uh, I'm glad that we've, we've got to be part of it and, and, you know, be along a little bit and be part of this little journey of you writing this book and, and getting to talk to you a couple of times. This is fun. I love it. And, I love you guys. Sharing. I love your show. Yeah. I love all your social Thank media. Well, oh, that's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But, but again, just to piggyback off that, you know, thank you for sharing your stories today and, and uh, certain parts of your, of your uh, life that uh, weren't, weren't easy, but uh, you're sharing with the world and, We appreciate you talking about them tonight. Anytime. And if anyone wants to buy my book, it comes out on October 22nd. It's a Tuesday. Nothing else is going on that day. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. And if you purchase my book from Amazon that day, you get a free audio book. Do it that way. Free audio book for 24 hours just on that day because I'm trying to get a bestseller. And if you get enough people to purchase your book on Amazon on all on the same day, you can get a bestseller. So that's my goal. And if, so go. if anyone wants to help me achieve that goal, I would really appreciate it. And I also, I welcome any feedback or um, emails or any, if anyone wants to reach out to tell me what they think about what I said today or anything like that, I welcome it. I really do. <laughs> so if you're watching this, the book comes out tomorrow. This will come out next Monday. So the book comes out tomorrow. True. Go get it. 22nd. Yep. And sign up to my website. Okay. Anytemple.com. Yep. You always have a lot going on there and you have a lot of, a lot of things to offer. I was, you know, revisited it as we were approaching today. So I know I'm going to start doing webinars and I'm doing intimacy coaching now. I'm doing all kinds of cool mm. shit. All right. And we would be remiss if we didn't thank you for introducing, introducing us to Ella Hot Wheels, who is up here on our <laughs> wall. Uh, and uh, we, we, we took this guy to see her for his birthday and uh, she came to our our fair state, and we 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 got to hang out with her in the afternoon, and uh, and then went back for her show. And and you're the one who told us all about. Isn't her, she so. awesome? She, she is. I love her. A lot of fun, I met her yes. in the strip club yeah. when I was uh, the massage goddess. <laughs> what a title! Ooh, what a title! The hell of a title! <laughs> I was too old to be a girl. Massage girl. That sounded so weird for. 40 something well, I, goddess just yeah i want a massage from a goddess more than from a girl i even had a so, cape made that said massage goddess on it nice because it was That's cold perfect. in there so i would have to wear the cape you know while i'm walking around and then when i would get hot nice. giving a massage i would just throw it off my shoulders yeah i like <laughs> it and she did tell us about your your 50th birthday party a little bit when we were talking to her but 
we never ever we we interviewed you before the 50th yeah so, that's right um, i hope it was a good time she it sounds like you guys had a blast from from, from it what was Alan told us, but it was really yeah. good the male stripper yeah that's the story do you want to hear it <laughs> yeah you have a few more minutes say, hold on. Wait, is it a story we can hear <laughs> Okay. Wait, let's, we don't have anywhere to now. go. Let's not leave on that. So about a year before my birthday party is when I started planning it. Before I even knew I was going to have a surgery or anything, right? And I was saving up money because I was going to pay for all my performers. And I posted an ad on Craigslist saying that I was looking for adult-oriented performers. And I wanted a, di a di diverse performance. And, like, I know a lot of people who perform in the adult entertainment industry but I really wanted to reach out and see if I could meet anybody new or find anybody new so this one gentleman responded and he was a male stripper and I was like awesome because I couldn't find a male stripper that would charge less than like $350 uh, for one show and I couldn't afford that so uh, this guy was willing to do to work for what I was paying which was $100 a show and I hired him to do two shows at my birthday so, oh. so here's he did on it for fifty. <laughs> so here's how most shows. So he said he's going to do four songs, and as a uh, female exotic dancer, that's what we usually did when I was dancing was four songs, and we would like start with our full costume, and then the next song we'd take you know our costume off, and then the next song the bra off, and the last song the bottoms, and we'd be completely nude, and that usually that's kind of the way it would go, you know. Sure, it's a strip tease, right? Right. Well, this guy got up on stage and he got naked immediately. <laughs> and he had like, it's just very big. Just saying. Very, 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 very big. Okay. And that's another thing because I've never seen male strippers that just showed it. They always had like a towel in front or, you know, would tease, like show for a second and then hide it or whatever. But yeah. this guy had nothing hiding it. And he did <laughs> Work. apparently he couldn't have found anything big enough to hide it from what oh you're saying. oh my gosh no so he was doing pole work contortionism like the most sensual Jeez. sexy dancer ever and all of the men because there was a ton of men at my birthday and most of them were like strip club or strip club guys they were all like uncomfortable the minute he got on stage and took his clothes off and they were all like kind of trying to look away you know but not be rude and and I went right no, up. No, they were and looking down at their package going, shit. <laughs> that too. Even guys that had <laughs> big packages were saying that. <laughs> and so, Damn it. So anyway, he gets he does this whole song. The women are mesmerized. The guys are uncomfortable. <clears throat> you know, and the song finally ends. And there's like a ripple of relief that goes through the, the men in, in the bar. <laughs> and then the next song starts. <laughs> and, he, and he keeps going. <laughs> So he does four, four, four songs, songs totally nude. I love it. By the end, the guys oh. were a lot more comfortable and they were clapping. And, and by his second show, they'd had more to drink. But it was just, <laughs> it was hilarious. Hey, I, well, I appreciate beauty. I'd have been like, yeah, I mean. <laughs> I had a high five. Well, it. I mean, I would have. <laughs> aren't you you guys would have been fine but you know some guys are oh, yeah. totally fine but there's a lot of guys who are uncomfortable with uh seeing other men naked sure. i don't know why <laughs> no, I, it, yeah. like, I don't want to see him naked <laughs> but that's different like <laughs> a guy i don't know i'm fine but i don't yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, it's funny you say that because it's like when I was stripping, I used to be totally fine getting naked in front of like a bar full of hundreds of people. But yeah. but if I had to do a strip show for my boyfriend at home, I would get all embarrassed and turn red. <laughs> Feel uncomfortable. <laughs> right. You're like, what the hell you do? This? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Well, um, more power to that guy. I mean, I understand. He's like, <laughs> I'm. I got nothing to hide. I'm, I want to show it off. Mm -hmm. So here you go. I'll definitely yeah. invite well, him to my next event. <laughs> invite me. I want to see this thing. <laughs> I would love it if you guys came to town. If you're ever up here, you just definitely have to let me know. Well, oh, I'm so, yeah, I know. We, absolutely. Fit, we start to make these little groups of, of people that we know, like now in your area, because of you and, and Ella and Aubrey vibes we've had on the podcast. Oh. So it's like we know someone, you know. Or, yeah, okay. yeah, it sounds like fun, we should have a little get trip. together. <laughs> yeah. I've never been to Canada, so. 
it'd, it'd be a fun uh, show if we could get everyone together. That'd be awesome. Totally. So I'd love it. And and if you have to bring the hammer, go ahead, bring the, <laughs> the hammer. guy with the, the hammer. Hammer. Uh, hammer. <laughs> <laughs> what was what, what was his stage name? Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman. What was he's it? on he's on Instagram. Oh. He's the he's okay. at the world's tallest contortionist. Oh. And he's okay. just beautiful. He's gorgeous. Yeah. I'll be we'll be following yeah, him. Yeah, definitely tonight. follow him. He's a he's really cool, super cool guy. Yeah. I expected a better name, but whatever. Like the <laughs> Frankie Hammer. Uh, yeah, Frankie <laughs> Hammer. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you but can okay. suggest it to him when. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness! All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Annie. Thank you. To wrap it up. Thank you for wrapping it up with that story. That's perfect. It is so a good tell one. them one more time where to go find the book and and all that good stuff. Since we go, since yeah, we go to my website annietemple dot com because I'll have a link and no matter where you are in the world, it will go to the correct Amazon for you rather than having to search it. You can just go to my website and click, and then you'll get taken straight to the book on October 22nd, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, and for buying on October 22nd, you also get a free audio book. And so you can listen to the whole thing in my voice. And also, please nice. give me your feedback. I love to hear from people. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. We, we love it. And... Uh, yes. When you're writing part two of the memoirs, let us know. We'll do this again. Awesome. My next book yeah, is probably going to be about oh. intimacy. Perfect. Oh. All right. And we like that too. stories. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Always a fun time. Love you guys. Thank you for listening. The tavern is closed for now, but we'd love to have you back for more fun next time. Seriously, though, get your asses out of here. <laughs>